This is Kelly Hill, editor for Test and Measurement for RCR Wireless News. In this episode of Carrier Rep, we talk with Saul Einbinder of Spirit Communications about the challenges involved with 5G testing. That interview after this. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Carrier Rep. This week, I have a nice long chat with Saul Einbinder, who is VP of Marketing for Spirit Communications. And this is about the ins and outs of 5G testing and how the economics of 5G impact testability and what that means for the development of an overall 5G ecosystem. There are a lot of carriers and infrastructure vendors who are trying to figure out exactly how 5G is going to work from a purely technical standpoint, as well as what business cases are going to support 5G investment. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Spirit, they do a lot of work in channel emulation, and that provides quite a bit of the basis for their perspective on 5G and challenges for test in this particular conversation. So here's that interview. This is Kelly Hill, editor for Test and Measurement with RCR Wireless News. I'm here with Saul Einbinder, who is VP of Marketing for Spirit Communications. How are you, Saul? Hi, Kelly. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, so let's talk a little bit about 5G and some of the implications for test. Now, I'm sort of curious as to what you guys as Spirant are seeing from your perspective uh, in terms of some of the hurdles that people are facing and, and how you guys are thinking about solutions. Okay, thanks. Um, so in our uh, channel emulation space, we focus on uh, helping the companies that are designing the new RF uh, systems, antennas and modems, you know, be it uh, chipset folks or, or uh, base station, uh, infrastructure, UEs, or, or even the carriers. Um, and uh, when we start looking at 5G, we're seeing something pretty interesting, which is it's not a linear progression from 2G to 3G to 4G. 5G is very, very different. Um, and it's very different uh, in, in terms of the challenges it's, provide, it's, it's, it's causing. And it's challenging the economics actually of testability, which is gonna have an impact if not solved on the ability for many companies to come in in the downstream and start developing solutions in 5G. The, the problem that we're seeing is, you know, when you, when, when you look at the use cases for 5G, fixed wireless and, um, and, and enhanced mobile broadband, I, I love how the wireless industry always puts an E in front of something, you know. Uh, oh, it's, now it's enhanced mobile broadband. Broad, <laughs> yeah. mobile broadband. That's that's cute. Um, <laughs> in any event, you look at those use cases as well as the IoT use case. You know there there's lots of differences in the network. Um, you know further into the network, network slicing and stuff. All good technologies. But back here in what's going on in the air, um, there's a problem. And as always, it's a problem of how much spectrum do we have. Uh, you know they're they're not making any more of it. Uh, and that when you when you look at the goals of 5G to cover all of these use cases, we need to squeeze a lot more bandwidth out of a given chunk of, of air, you know, out of a given, you know, square hundred meters of air, we need to get like a hundred times more total capacity out of that space. And how are we doing that? Well, uh, mostly that's by by uh, moving up into higher frequencies where we have wider bandwidths uh, available, uh, and also by being really careful about uh, being taking advantage of beam forming, uh, you know, as opposed to a typical cellular environment where maybe we have got uh, three directions that a typical cell tower is 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 transmitting. Uh, you know, now we want to be able to send a beam to a user over here and a different beam you know, 30 degrees away over there or even tighter. We want to be able to slice the air uh, for folks at ground level versus folks uh, at, at fifth floor level. Um, and in order to do that, we're using beam forming antenna arrays. So all of a sudden we're going from a few antennas like in a, let's say a four by four MIMO uh, situation. Now all of a sudden we're jumping into you know, 16 by four arrays and 32 by eight arrays and, and, and even higher. So we went from having a few antennas that we were dealing with very quickly into dozens of antennas, dozens of antennas and hundreds of antennas. I think, um, I think it was at uh, Mobile World Congress this year, Ericsson was showing 
uh, a 28 gig array with 100 elements in it, all integrated. Um, you know that that's not the most extreme that we've seen, but it was, you know very very small. Uh, you know, so these things are being developed now. And from a channel emulation perspective, that means we've got an exponential growth, and that's really where the from from the testing and design perspective, things go nonlinear. 2G, 3G, 4G. Oops! All of a sudden, 5G. It isn't just about faster. Of course, it is faster. It isn't just about higher bandwidth. Yes, it's higher bandwidth. It's also about a dramatic increase in the number of RF channels between every one of those antennas and and the UE uh, and you know all those multipaths. So. You need a lot more channels. You need much more processing capacity inside of a channel emulator to model all of that. Uh, and the normal curve of technology getting less expensive uh, isn't fast enough to compensate for how quickly that number of links is going up. The problem with that is, well, sure, stuff got more expensive. All right, but it's more profound than stuff got more expensive because if you try to solve that problem by saying, Hey, great for the for the channel and guys, we're going to sell you a lot of supports. The problem is, if you think to the economic side of what's driving demand, it's not as if end users are suddenly willing to pay, you know, a hundred times more for stuff, right? There isn't that much money. If you think about all of the chipset vendors, all the UE vendors, they've got certain budgets, yearly budgets that that they're kind of used to. Those things can't exponentially grow. So therefore, in order for us to bridge the gap from where we are now, where people are putting together test solutions kind of in the early days, bridge the gap from that to when lots and lots of designers and engineers are coming in and building all of the future products, the testability has to go through some big changes. We can't just keep doing things the way we were doing them before uh, because the economics just break down. Well, absolutely, especially when you start talking about an IoT context. You know, there's not a whole lot of people talking about super expensive IoT devices. Uh, right. So, yeah, that's one. So, so then how are you guys thinking about addressing that then? You know, is, are, is there more software? Is, are things more module, modular? Um, you know, how, how do you address that issue of, you know, cost of test and scalability for a new technology that, you know, I think in a lot of cases, you know, and I've, I've seen this come up at conferences again and again, you know, when you're dealing with these frequencies, you're dealing with, um, you know, a need in a lot of times for more expensive components, um, you know, uh, just seems more expensive kind of end to end. Yep, you're right. Things, each, each, link in a test solution. So let's just step back for a moment and say, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to do testing of beam forming in your 128 by 8 uh, eNode B array. Uh, so maybe we're doing over the air, we're in a large chamber. Uh, you want to be able to, uh, to, to capture all of those, those signals and be able to uh, understand each one is a radio path. So the channel emulator is is, is emulating those, those paths. Um, and you know, it needs an RF that's at the right frequency that got more expensive. It needs much more bandwidth. Uh, so that's done uh, pretty often with what's called bandwidth concatenation in the instrument. You take a, a you know, a hundred gig channel, a hundred megahertz channel and another hundred megahertz channel and on and on, you can stack them together, but that's more channels. Um, the, the DSPs have to run much faster uh, at 28 gig than they did at, at, a, at a six gig or below solution. So yeah, the hardware itself just on a unit basis got more expensive and then there's many, many times more of it. Um, so what we're doing is uh, a few things. We've, we've kind of broken the problem down into solutions that are in the traditional, let's say less than six gig uh, space versus 28. And we've broken things down by what can we do conducted mode versus what can we do over the air. And in each one of those four places, we've kind of got, you might call it, you know, a best practice for how to go about uh, testing, whether you're looking at the UE side or the base station or, or both. Um, so some of, the, some of the techniques that we're, we're employing, um, for example, um, we have a solution in the conducted space where we use a new piece of hardware that you can sort of think of as an RF preprocessor. And the idea is, you know, a channel emulator is an expensive piece of gear uh, because it's so flexible, right? It's got all of this 
DSP horsepower and RF horsepower, so it can kind of do almost anything, if you will. Um, but if, uh, if you're able to put sort of a preprocessor in front of that to calculate some of the uh, RF uh, multipath, almost in hardware, if you will, then you offload the, the amount of, of uh, DSP resource that you need inside the channel emulator. So that's, that's a, new, a whole new test methodology uh, that, that we've been uh, working with uh, to, to kind of crack the code in that quadrant, in the sub six conducted mode. Um, you know, so, so those, that's just one example of one of the types. It, I think in that case, uh, the back of the envelope is, it cuts by like a factor of four, the kind of costs and complexity and number of cables and wires that you'd need versus kind of a brute force, let me just sell you lots of more ports. <laughs> yeah, because you know it's kind of funny. Um, yeah, uh, you know, that, then that I guess that's the real question: Does it actually cut cut the costs? Um, you know, or does that come later as things get more to scale? More, you know, as things scale up, you yeah. know, the technology kind of moves forward. Um, unfortunately, you, you need something <laughs> as soon as possible uh, for a lot of these cases. Um, yeah. Are you so? Are, I'm curious as to what you're seeing in terms of. Um, you know, we have some operators who are already deploying uh, 5G fixed wireless mm. um, trials and, yep. uh, and expecting to, to commercialize that stuff fairly rapidly. Uh, yeah. and we have folks uh, like T-Mobile, for instance, who are already sort of thinking about uh, mobile 5G and, and how they're going to do that. Um, you know, also talking about, uh, you know, low band uh, still... Um, you know, relatively high, but, you know, 600 megahertz or, you know, Sprint talking about 2.5 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are you seeing in terms of, um, in terms of fixed versus mobile and uh, in any particular spectrum that people are, are people pretty focused on millimeter wave versus sub six? Well, uh, I think we've seen uh, interest from all corners. Uh, you know, the, we are so active this year uh, it, you know, really feel a lot of pull from the marketplace in all of those spaces. Uh, the test methodologies are different. Uh, you know, one of the challenges you get into when you cross from the lower uh, bandwidth stuff into the millimeter wave, in the lower bandwidth, you can take advantage of conducted mode pretty easily, meaning you kind of separate, um, separate testing the antenna from the modem by you know, coupling onto with a wire where the antenna would be, and now you can do on a lab bench instead of in a chamber. When you get to 28, um, that becomes pretty infeasible. Most of the designs we see, you know, the intent, well, at 28, the bandwidth is, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the you know, the, because the frequency is so much higher, the wavelength is smaller, the antenna got teeny, itsy bitsy. Uh, so there's no place, there's no connector there anymore. And in some cases, like, uh, you know, I think it was maybe Ericsson and IBM, I think were showing a completely integrated uh, um, 10 by 10 array at Mobile World Congress this year. Integrated meaning the electronics are right there on a, on, you know, right behind the array itself. There's no place to go and, and plug a cable and it can't be done. So the issue there is you wind up getting pushed into over the air uh, and now you're in chambers. And the, the chambers are, are uh, extremely expensive. Uh, so, you know, one of the challenges in the fixed wireless where folks are looking at 28 is to do the lab testing. Um, many of the types of, of entities that were, that they're talking about testing, some of the design teams, uh, they don't have those chambers around. You know, there aren't, there aren't lots of them. They cost, you know, the kind of million dollar sorts of things, especially when you get into you know, three and five meter ones. Um, so, you know, we've been looking at solutions to make better use. Uh, we have some solutions that allow us to work with intermediate frequencies in the cases where those are available and, and go back to conducted mode. Um, we have solutions that allow us to, instead of using a five meter chamber, do some, uh, kind of break the problem apart and do some of it in a two meter chamber. Uh, so now you've got much more, much greater access to those sorts of, of chambers. So. Uh, you know, when you're talking about asking about uh, fixed versus uh, mobile and 28 versus six, my mind goes to conducted and over the air, and and we are seeing demand from all all of those corners. Uh, uh, just in the last six months, uh, it's kind of coming from everywhere. Okay, great. 
Uh, so I'm curious, sort of in, in that context, um, can we take a, just a step back for a second and, and talk a little bit about the industry's capabilities and, and some of the challenges for, for test um, and the test industry when it comes to, uh, you know, being able to handle these bandwidths? Uh, you know, you guys are sort of used to being on the cutting edge of development. You know, obviously there's, I think there's a, it seems to me a very fast push you know, to move in this direction to tackle the challenges of these millimeter wave, uh, in particular, um, engineering challenges there. Um, you know, how would you sort of rate the capabilities of the industry at this point to, you know, to be able to, to test 5G? And, and how do you yeah. see that sort of evolving, uh, you know, as, as we get further into, further down that road? So, um that's a really interesting question, and and you know it, it it's right next to the question of which which you know you hear from the corners a little bit you know kind of the whispers of the industry is five G really going to work at all? You know some of this stuff is super challenging, right? I wonder that myself sometimes. <laughs> right, um, you know if if you're talking about fixed wireless and you have to worry about the difference between when the leaves are on the trees and when they're not on the trees, how are you going to make that work? Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm naturally a pretty skeptical person, um, but I'm really encouraged and I'm encouraged for a couple of reasons. First, you're seeing a lot of really good innovation. You're seeing people who are tackling that, um, you know, that, that direct line of sight transmission problem with kind of hybrid solutions that are able to count on, uh, on, on uh, combining LTE and 5G and non-line of sight solutions. You see some good creative things there. Um, we, we're seeing a lot of willingness from the early players to think out of the box. Um, and so the, the solutions that we're bringing around our particular channel emulation space, um, a lot of it is coming in cooperation with a couple of key lead, lead customers. Um, right now we're at the, the stage where people are just trying to make things work. Uh, so you're not yet uh, on the whole worried about getting the economics of test down. We are because you know we're trying to make sure that we get there in a, in, a, in a year. Well, the industry gets there, you know, 12 months from now, 24 months from now, that we're able to make it easy for those waves of engineers to to come in. Um, you know, but right now it's still it's still pretty much proving that the that the technologies are going to work. the The other place where we're active is in the standards bodies, and um, you know the industry has a really good track record now in terms of getting to standards in a way that we did not, you know, we didn't have that track record, track record 10 years ago. Um, you know, standards have, you know, we all know the joke. The nice thing about standards is there's so many to choose from, right? And, uh, you know, as a designer, standards tend to lag what you can and want to do. But, you know, look at the success of LTE, right? You know, my, my phone works anywhere in the world and it works well anywhere in the world. There aren't really very many technologies that do that. You know, my 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 uh, my wall plug, you know, doesn't work anywhere in the world, but my cell phone does. Um, and so, the three GPP and all of the associated Etsy and CTIA and on and on, um, they've done a really good job of being the place where these things are getting worked out. You know, so we're doing presentations at at standards and uh, standards bodies and working with the folks there, um, and I think that's working in a way uh, that's serving the industry very, very well right now. So, you know, that, that gives me some, some pretty good optimism. Uh, that combined with the solutions we're seeing, I think we're gonna get there. Okay, great. Well, thanks for the time today, Saul. I appreciate your perspective. Thanks, Kelly. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks Have so much. Have a good one. Thanks, you too. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, and hopefully you get some good insights on laying the groundwork for 5G going forward. If you have comments or suggestions, you can email me at khill, K-H-I-L-L, at rcrwireless.com. Thanks for joining us, and hope to see you next time on Carrier Wrap.